Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Media Life here on TV3. My name is Pa Kwisiasari, and coming up in the next 60 minutes. Government procures five tractors, four mechanical planters, and accessories to expand the prison farm services. Also this hour, angry mob in the eastern region kills suspected armed robber by setting him ablaze. In sports, Anthony Joshua sensationally beaten by Andy Ruiz Jr. at the Madison Square Garden. And elsewhere in the world, China Defense Minister Wei Fenhe defends crackdown in 1989 Tiananmen Square protest. We've got the very latest details of all these stories, plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. We're also very active on social media. Our handle is TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Let's begin with our very first story. And the Ghana Beyond Aid Committee is demanding explanation and apology from a Ghanaian artist who plagiarized a photo of a high-rise building in Kenya, which has been used as a cover of the Ghana Beyond Aid strategy document. Richmond Bansa was commissioned to produce an original artwork that reflects the vision of the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda and the highlights of the strategy document. But he allegedly plagiarized a photo of Dawid Insurance Limited headquarters in Nairobi that's triggering criticism against the government, with some persons de describing the act as embarrassing. While government officials initially downplay the issue and ask people rather to focus attention on the content. But the committee in charge of the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda uh, issued a statement Friday to apologize for the gap. In a, st in a separate letter to the artist, uh, Richmond Banta, the committee said it needs an explanation as to why he plagiarized someone's work as against producing original artwork. Now for the committee, what happened was a singular act of indiscretion and a lack of professionalism on the part of Banta. His action, the committee noted, brought embarrassment to the president, the Ghana Beyond Aid Committee, and its chairman, for which reason he ought to explain and apologize. Elsewhere, a suspected thief who is said to have been part of a gang that stole goats uh, from uh, Tenguanya near the Kloago, a farming community in the eastern region, has been burnt alive in a car boot by an angry mob. The thieves, after the operation, were spotted by some young men who gave them a chase on a motorbike. However, the thieves overpowered the man and shot him dead, uh, two of the youth who were pursuing them. The community members uh, alerted residents of a nearby town who blocked the main road and acc accosted the thieves at Huhunya. Now, two of the thieves managed to escape in the ensuing scaffold, but luck ran out for one of them who was tied up, locked in a boot of a car used for the stealing and bent alive with a stolen goat. Well, we're trying hard to reach the Eastern Regional Police Public Relations Officer uh, Ebenezer uh, Tete to get some more details on this developing story. So as and when we do, we'll bring you the very, very latest. You still watch your media life here on TV3. Now, people in authority have been urged to give equal opportunities to women who qualify to take leadership positions in society. Now, at a program to promote gender equality, speakers push for the participation of women in decision-making processes at all levels. Adolescents, many girls are able to voice their feelings and demonstrate a strong sense of self-confidence. According to CARE, adolescence is a time of psychological risk and heightened vulnerability for girls. This notwithstanding, many girls are unable to take up leadership positions when they grow up owing to low self-esteem, lack of opportunities and low self-confidence. 
It is in this light that 59 girls in leadership positions from the St. John Senior High School, Amasaman Senior High School, and other junior high schools in the Ganoth Municipality are to benefit from a mentorship and transformational training. TV3 News anchor and UNICEF menstrual ambassador Wendy Lai, who advised the girls on menstrual hygiene, also mentored them on taking up leadership roles. The Girls Governance Camp, organized by Leading Ladies Network, offered me the opportunity to share my experience with about 59 young ladies. We spoke about leadership and social development. We also spoke about a very critical topic which has become a global concern and that is menstruation. Some students receive sanitary pads. Administrator of Leading Ladies Network Felicia Mensa urged Ghanaians to support girls who take up leadership roles. One of the sessions we had was start to build confidence and realize that menstrual health, especially when they are in their menses, um, some of them, it affects their confidence, especially when somebody sees them and they have sold themselves, they kind of feel shy. But we, we wanted them to know that it's part of what women go through. Co-founder of Leader Freak International, Leticia Ohini Efa, is first her support in ensuring good leadership among women in the country. Some students also shared their experiences on menstruation. This program is really educative. It's very helpful. And it teaches you to be confident. It teaches you to be humble. It teaches you to help you be an independent woman. We shouldn't allow ourselves to engage in these cultures that our elders and other people engage in, like shutting you close because you're menstruating. Maybe you're not supposed to cook. It's all part of things that are breaking self-confidence in girls. When um, you're menstruating, you shouldn't feel shy about it. For instance, if you go somewhere, you shouldn't let your emotions or what you're going through, like for instance, if you get an abdominal cramp, you shouldn't let it overtake what you are doing. The Leading Ladies Network is a non-profit organization that nurtures, trains and serves as a resource base for women and girls to enhance their development as leaders for positive social change. Enthusiastic. Now, parents of Kofi Eswa in the Doma Central Municipality of the Bono region have devised means to solve their school's infrastructure challenge in the face of slow response to the applied. Stanley Niblo has more. Government introduced education in Kofi Eswa in the early 90s after a pavilion was provided to shelter pupils. Since then, government has not provided infrastructure again. The growing population of the school compelled parents to improvise. Through communal labor and monthly contributions, they have been able to provide the school with a befitting office, classroom blocks for the primary pupils and the kindergarten. They have also converted the old pavilion into a complete classroom block which now accommodates junior high pupils while another has been built to serve as library. Parents are happy they are impacting lives. Former assemblyman for the area, Stephen Kwame Asante Kobia, is part of the mobilization team for the development. <laughs> The kindergarten structure is not spacious enough and so the school authorities have converted the library into classroom and now accommodated by KG pupils. The enrollment have been increased and sustained by the school feeding program. Head teacher of the school, Andrew Skufiatha, said provision of teaching and learning materials has been a concern. He's worried about the constant exploitation of pupils by parents. Because this community is a farming community, most of the parents do not uh, encourage their children, especially with this trend of education, to come to school. And there are some, because of financial constraint, 
they take their children to come and then help them to do farming work. Away from Kofi Eswa, government has put in place a strategy in place to gain rice self-sufficiency by 2023. The Food and Agric Minister, Dr. Usui Friyakoto, who made this known at a news conference in Accra, said funds to import the produce could be saved for developmental projects. Here's a news desk report by my colleague, Selom Amenya. We have other crops that could earn us as much or even more than cocoa that we have ignored all these years. And this is what planting for food and jobs, the module planting for export and rural development seeks to tackle, that we develop the other crops that nature, God has given this country to its full potential. So instead of having one crop giving us two billion, you have six crops each giving us two billion a year and not rely on import and support farmers in other countries to supply us with the food. And rice is a classic example. According to the sector minister, a number of interventions, including supporting smallholder farmers, adopting best agronomic practices, and expanding domestic access to output market, have been put in place to increase productivity. The ministry expects domestic rice production to increase from the current 456,000 metric tons of milled rice in 2018 and reach self-sufficiency by 2020 after the production of 1,665,000 metric tons. Exim Bank of India for a $150 million facility for uh, farm mechanization. In the case of rice, we have the capacity for production that we are installing now in the forest belt and savannah, but we don't have the mills. We're going to provide the mills and timelines, definitely by the end of the year, we will have mills uh, dotted around the growing areas. He indicated a total of 1,698 metric tons of rice seed were made available for cultivation for the 2017 growing season. The 2018 cropping season recorded an increase as a total of 2,400 metric tons was made available to farmers. But wouldn't this also affect businesses which engage in the importation of the commodity? It creates opportunity for them. They have to switch. I mean, they are on the retail end of the value chain. They know their customers and so on. They have to link up with the association of rice farmers and so on. And as I say, it creates business opportunities. Now, government has procured five tractors, four mechanical planters and accessories to expand the prison farm services. It has also secured 640 acres of arable land at a draft for the establishment of a prison camp for crop and livestock production. Here's a report by Peter Kwao Adato. The Ghana Prison Service engaged in agricultural activities in its early days, mainly on subsistent basis. However, in 1992, it became necessary to revamp the agric unit to be more productive and as an alternative way of addressing the increasing government expenditure on prisoners' ration. Unfortunately, government support for the project lasted only for a while. As a result, the benefits of revenue generation, equipping inmates with improved modding and scientific agric production skills, production of food crops to supplement inmates' feeding, and the contribution towards food security in the country were lost. Government, under the Planting for Food and Jobs initiative, has acquired five tractors, four mechanical planters, and accessories for the expansion of prisons' farms. A 640-acre land has also been acquired at Ejra to establish a camp prison for the production of maize and livestock. Through the delivery support of the Ejra Traditional Council, aimed at producing large quantities of maize and livestock to supplement the rush of inmates. The construction of a prototype camp prison at Ejra is already underway with support from the Church of Pentecost and additional four in other parts of the country. In order to help achieve these large goals, the Church of Pentecost has decided to construct a prototype camp prison 
at Ijwa. The project is ongoing. Additionally, a paper producing factory was commissioned at the Sawan Medium Security Prison under the One District, One Factory initiative. These would further improve the skills of prisoners as well as to decongest the prisons. All right, still on agriculture, stakeholders in the agri sector have stressed the need to build the capacity of women in agribusiness to improve their production output and business performance. At a ceremony to launch the Women in Food and Agri Forum in Accra, the executive director of Agri House Foundation, Alberta Nanai Cham Akosa, pointed out that empowering more women farmers will speed up economic growth. Women are the key actors in Ghana's agriculture sector, constituting over half of the labor force and producing 70% of the country's food stock. However, smallholder farmers face gender-specific constraints such as access to land, credit facilities and markets. As part of efforts to provide a sustainable platform to discuss issues pertinent to women in the industry, the Agri House Foundation, with support from the ADB, the governments of Canada and Interplus, have come up with the Women in Food and Agricultural Leadership Forum and Expo Wufa Greek 2019. Since our mandate is aimed at improving agri in, in Ghana, and this program is also aimed at actually empowering more women to engage in agri and, and move them from their normal subsistence farming into large scale. That is why we want to be part of this particular project and actually move movement, empower more women to be like the, the, their men counterpart. Irrigation manager Interplus Limited calls for conscious efforts to ensure women and men in agriculture have equal access to productive resources. We want to give uh, farmers, and in this case women who are into uh, farming, want to give them uh, um, modern irrigation techniques that are really easy to use. Uh, this model has proven its efficiency. Once uh, um, the irrigation system is implemented, well managed, then uh, the cost of this system is easily recovered by the extra um, production and extra income the farmers uh, are making. Executive Director of AgriHouse Foundation, Alberta Nanecha Akosa, is confident the forum and expo would strengthen agribusiness enterprises in the country and also become a platform to mentor and coach young women interested in venturing into agribusiness. Conversation on agriculture is changing and we, we, we believe it's time for women to also contribute in shaping the conversation. Women are, have contributed a lot, uh, but we believe that with a great platform, will we'll create that platform for continuous dialogue, uh, to mentor, to empower more women, and basically to also attract more women to get into agriculture. Some activities lined up for the Maiden Women in Food and Agriculture Forum Expo, scheduled for June 12 in Ho, include mentorship dialogues, exhibitions, and gold in the soil awards. Away from agriculture, let's find out what's happening in the extractive industry. Because government has secured a $3 million from the World Bank to implement the multi-sectorial mining integrated project to help curb the menace of illegal mining in Ghana. It is taken to raise $200 million from the international partners to help ensure sustainable mining in the country. Here's a report by Benjamin Adu. The multi-sectorial mining integrated project was launched in 2018 in the wake of illegal mining activities which destroyed several acres of land across the country. The project, according to the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, is to help reclaim lands destroyed through illegal mining activities. It also entails training for artisans and small-scale miners on modern technologies that could be incorporated into small-scale mining to ensure sustainability. Dr. Isaac Bonsu Kakari is a national coordinator of the multi sectoral mining integrated project. Local communities will be equipped with the capacity um, to be able to rehabilitate some of the areas that we have already rendered uh, unproductive. Deputy Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Nana Eia, underscored the need to halt activities of illegal mining and introduce more sustainable and environmentally friendly practices. Galamse activities are known to affect food security and other ecosystem services, including soil and water. Dean of Faculty of Renewable Natural Resources at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, 
Professor Trey Boatin, in a speech read on behalf, outlined the importance of the project. Illegal mining activities are known to adversely affect food security and biodiversity conservation in many mining communities. Local communities are deprived of livelihood assets, including fertile land, non-timber forest products and other ecosystem services such as soil and water. Now that's good news for us because journalists of Ghana's leading media organization, Media General, won seven awards at the Made in GJ Ashanti Media Awards in Kumasi. The journalists who have been churning out compelling development-oriented stories were honored for impactful stories. Broadcast journalist Beatrice Piogabra, who was the only female among 21 journalists shortlisted, won in two categories, Best Health Reporting and Best HIV and AIDS Reporting, while Ibrahim Abubakar emerged the Best Journalist in TV Feature, with Benjamin Adu receiving the Best Journalist in Sports Reporting Award. Ibrahim was also adjudged the second best journalist in agriculture reporting and again the second best journalist in SME reporting. Benjamin Edu also received the award for the second best journalist in culture and tourism reporting. Media General Bureau Chief for the Northern Sector, Kofi Edu Domfe, was honored for exemplary and inspiring journalism. Chairman of the National Media Commission chastised some journalists for misinforming the public. The National Media Commission is marshalling all resources to ensure integrity in the profession. We have an image, we have an integrity, and we must maintain it. Because the relationship between us and the public is not bought, it's trust. When we lose the trust, we will forfeit them. And that will be very, very dangerous. Regional Chairman of the GJA, Kingsley Hope, touched on the need for journalists to champion the fight against climate change. We need to fight the negative effects of climate change, which is a significant challenge to achieving sustainable development and threatens to drag millions of people into climate poverty. Director of the Forest Research Institute of Ghana, Dr. Daniel Enim Ofori, emphasized the significant role journalists play in ensuring environmental sustainability. President of the Ghana Journalists Association, Dr. Roland Afilmoni, stated as part of its 70th anniversary, the GJA will launch a war on sanitation. Our foremost agenda is to repurpose journalism. This will mean moving journalism, moving the paradigm from the obsessive and compulsive politics to journalism which will sharpen its focus on social ills like sanitation, water, roads, social infrastructure. We have surplus of politics and deficits. Other media houses and personalities received awards for their contribution to journalism in the region. Winners of Media General. Now, the police in Amasaman are seeking public assistance in tracing the relatives of Edusai, believed to be six years uh, or more. Now, Edusai was sent to the Amasaman police station at about 10 p.m. Monday, May 27, by some good Samaritans. The boy was reportedly loitering around aimlessly and could not tell where he was coming from. Uh, anyone who knows Edusai or his relatives should please contact the Amasaman police or the nearest police station uh, for assistance. You're still watching Midday Life here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're also very active on social media. Our uh, handle is TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Still ahead, we've got the very latest news. Yeah, welcome back to Media Life here on TV3. Let's do some business news now. And exhibitors at the second edition of the National Baby and Toddler Fair underway at the Marina Mall have lauded parents who patronized the fair for their efforts aimed at developing the minds and well-being of the awards. The fair, which is a partnership with Media General and Planet One, is giving huge discounts on items, products and services on sale has everything that speaks to the needs of babies, new and expectant parents. Items on sale range from learning materials, baby wear, 
toys among others. Suppliers, dealers and manufacturers of baby products and services are happy to be part of the fair. As the betas express delight about turnout and the efforts of parents in developing the award's welfare. We deal in an educational program geared towards the development of your child's brain through books that talk and sing for them. So these are books and multimedia for developing all of their awareness, all of their attitudes and then all of their abilities. It's actually a good place for you to come in. It brings out the exposure for people to come in and then know the varieties of the food you have. So it's very good. A lot of parents want their children to read because they realize that reading helps the children to improve their grammar, you know, their writing skills, and also helps them to learn other subjects, okay? So a lot of people are encouraging their kids to read, and that is how come they come here to buy books for them. Initially, when events like this come up, you hardly see parents come here with kids, but here lies a case whereby there's been a couple of parents who come here with kids and even try to buy one or two stuff they sell. So I think it's a plus. We, those who came for mummies, aunties, daddies, and uncles, um, they try to get everything else for the kids first before they come to us. Yes. So I think I think so far they are more in interested in buying the stuff for the kids and developing the kids than they are for themselves personally. With an impressive turnout and patronage, organizers are hopeful of a nationwide patronage of the fair. I want to see this fair happening in all regions. I mean, we are connected. We are coming to Takrabi in collaboration with Connect. We'll be going to Kumasi in collaboration with Akuma FM at the end of the year. So, I mean, Kumasi should watch out. Um, Takrabi should also watch out. And then Tamale, Sunyani, Gotarini should also watch out. We've got business coming because we realized, as I said earlier on, there isn't any platform that brings together, and that this is a discounted term. Patrons are assured of quality and durable product to meet their numerous expectations. So if not being at the Marina Mall where the National Baby and Toddler Fair is underway, trust me, you're missing big because this is a fair that is giving a huge discount on items on sale. There's also expert advice to new and expectant parents. And so take advantage of this very opportunity and be here. From the Marina Mall here at Accra, Josh Cronin reporting for TV3. All right, the huge growth in mobile money wallets has boosted the country's drive towards greater financial inclusion. But subscribers have not been able to keep up with the technology, thereby making them prey for, uh, to fraudsters. Now, the operators have been charged to do more to protect the users of the platform. Alfred Okanse has the rest of the story. has been overwhelming after the Bank of Ghana replaced the branchless bank guidelines with the electronic money guidelines in 2015. 66.4 billion cities was recorded in the first quarter of the year compared to 52.4 billion cities over the same period last year. Such exponential growth over the past four years is attracting sophisticated fraudulent activities. This is typical mobile money fraudsters in a telephone call. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Afternoon. Madam Madam Cyber and e crime analyst Eric Mensa expects wallet holders to keep up with technology. Criminals are preying on key vulnerabilities uh, within the system. Key amongst them is the lack of security consciousness of uh, subscribers. And you realize that scams is one, counterfeiting. Some members of the public shared how they are able to identify fraudsters. Also, I'm MTN Mobile, 350. I will give me phone so. And to me, checking my account, see ya. And I'm a but me, a yeah, MTN phone can say 
obi sana and check your account at the uh, immediately and i miss all this can in my or see obi yari or oh, hospital and he found sick or label now permitra no kasati so bia why yari ya i say oh or dahi or sick or label and i miss you your cry or call you why you can't or see there be on you call you or walk man see and i miss you come see if i was you come see call you and i miss you come see so call you oh i think one of them the voice was from a lady and then she will call you and she will start speaking a local language with you. And she will be like, she is one of your relatives abroad. So if you actually have a relative abroad, you might think it is true. My sister was once a victim. They actually got her. I think she's in 500 cities also. The telecoms chamber says it is engaging operators and the regulator to identify fraudulent transactions. They also advise the public to be on the lookout. Some uh, uh, tidbits that we share with customers. The first one being that um, your mobile money pin is like the most important thing to you. That's what first, first and foremost, that's your secret. So you don't share your secret with anyone if you don't want to be exposed in any, in any way or the other. And it's also important to say that the froster would require your active uh, um, support or participation to be able to defraud you of your money on the wallet. So the second one is you do not entertain calls to discuss your, your mobile money wallet. Data from the Payment Systems Department of the Bank of Ghana shows the use of checks as a means of payment declined in the first quarter of 2019. You've got to beware of fraudsters. Now, Cabinet has approved a master plan for the redevelopment of the Ghana International Trade Fair Center. The Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Agnes Edu, made this known at a news conference in Accra. The redevelopment of the Trade Fair Center into a modern trade exhibition site is expected to take about three to five years and will be carried out in three phases. The first phase will lead to development of a 12,000-seater trade convention center. You go there, you are at the convention, but you play there, you shop there, you eat there, you sleep there, and all that is in one enclave, so you don't drive 10 minutes outside of the convention center and then come back uh, the next day. So hotel will be part of the convention center area. So in, in most places and also in this master plan, that hotel will actually be connected directly into the uh, convention center. Government will adopt a multi-developer and public-private partnership PPP arrangement for the project to put Ghana at par with the likes of Kenya, South Africa and Rwanda. During the redevelopment, trade fairs are to be organized in the regions. What I want to do during redevelopment is to take trade fairs into the regions. So into, we've gone to the north, we'll probably go back to Tamale, Takrade, we'll go to uh, Central, we, we will tour as, as mandate. She enumerated some challenges inhibiting the project, which include 2 million cities in rent arrears by tenant as at August 2017. I look in the books and every single tenant in 2017 has expired tenancy and they owe the company 50,000, 60,000, and no one was collecting it. Two million was sitting on the site and I can't pay workers. Workers were in arrears 18 months. So I decided every business has a product. Our product is that we have land that we are leasing to tenants and you need to pay even if it's 50 pesos per square meter. So I set a 90-day plan and I decided that that 2 million will be collected or you'll be evicted by law. Power and water to the center had to be curtailed due to non-payment of bills. According to the CEO, her management has been able to collect 800,000 cities from defaulting tenants since assuming office in August 2017. Thanks very much for watching Midday Live here on TV3. We came to you live from our studios here at Adesawe in Kanda. A crowd we stream live on Facebook. For more news, you can log on to our website, www3news.com. My name is Parkus Yasari. Thanks for watching.